what we have seen portrayed in the video is an imagination, a little bit of a license that thinks about where the shepherds were and what they might have been thinking past the event of Christmas. What had they experienced? I want us to read this morning the story, the well-known story in Luke chapter 2. It is the story of the shepherds. And I want us to think this morning about the difference between hearing and listening. There were shepherds living in the fields, Luke records, near keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was this great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those to whom his favor rests. I want us to see what the shepherds were doing. They were doing what shepherds do, sitting on the hillside as they had for generations, sitting through the night hours, which they had done season after season after long, long season, into the night with nothing more than perhaps a little firelight from the fire campfire they kept throughout the night as they watched the moon move across the horizon from horizon to horizon. And feeling the chill of the night, they are just taking care of the routine business that will fund and supply the many sacrificial lambs that are are required over and over and over at the temple in Jerusalem. They're vigilant in the night for any kind of prowling animals. They're looking into the shadows of the dark landscape for any shadow of a prowling animal that might come suddenly unsuspected and unnoticed into the area of the sheep where there would be great threat and great danger. Can you imagine it? And then suddenly in the middle of this as we read it, there is a star. They've seen a million stars in the darkness of the sky night after night, but there is a star that suddenly shines brighter than all the other stars, and it becomes brighter and brighter and brighter until out of that shining star comes the figure of a being, what looks like a man, who begins to announce good news to them. How do they explain this? Is this the galactical disaster that they had heard about that from rumors of the past? Was it, was it a meteor that's on collision course with the earth? There's all kinds of things that could enter their heads. And yet here the angel of the Lord speaks to them out of that very moment. And they choose to not only hear it, but they choose to listen. The shepherds heard the angel. But we know they did more than hear it. They listened because the scripture tells us in the next verses that they said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us. And they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I want us to notice this morning as we begin to think about this, it's very feasible and possible that what they had heard, and after they've even gone to see the Messiah in a manger, they would suddenly begin to settle in over the long haul, the impact of what they were witnessing. It is entirely possible that they would, and reasonable that they would fear Herod. 
if they hear the story. Besides, they have, they have a mixed bag of reputation among the people. Some people see them as, as just storytellers who make up stories. And, and what would you expect? And night after night in a campfire, what do you do while you're watching the sheep? And you make up these stories. And many of them are fanciful stories. And some people had come to see the shepherds as, as unworthy messengers of any kind of truth. Others saw them as, as those who had a reputable career in their lives. And yet in the middle of the night, out of the darkness, they hear something they've never heard before and they choose to listen. Even though they might wonder, did we hear what we hear, heard? Is this really going to be the Messiah? What happens after all the joy of what we've just read about and the weeks pass and they're sitting around thinking about what they experienced? What's in this for us? I submit to you that I think we can relate. We are, we are living the routines of daily life taking care of business, trying to make ends meet, trying to make a living, trying to protect your family, trying to protect your employment, trying to protect your reputation, trying to protect your unknown, uncertain future in the darkness. You don't know what's going to happen next. The darkness which hides the potential of enemies, enemies that all of us can understand, the enemies that for some of us has become too real, the enemies of illness, the enemy of financial reverse, the enemy of the loss of employment, the enemy that troubles your marriage, the challenges that you have with your children, the betrayal of a friend. And you listen in the darkness, trying to be alert to the next thing that's coming at you. And you're focused, looking for any threat on the horizon that's a part of 2024. I think we can relate to the shepherds who've been waiting for Messiah, not sure what the future holds, uncertain in their reputation. The daylight of a brand new day. They're listening into the darkness, but they hear nothing. Night after night after night, except the rustle of the grass and the wind through the trees and the prairie. Listening for God to speak out of the darkness. If you're there this morning, I think the shepherds, and their experience and their view of Christmas has something to say to us about learning to listen out of the darkness and the uncertainty of your life. How do you do that? How do you learn to listen and recognize the voice of God in the darkness? Because too often the darkness has a noise that's more deafening than the loudest noise that could distract you. It's the silence that keeps us from listening in the darkness to the voice of God. How do you do that? Well, the first one I put in your notes this morning is, is learning to not only hear, but to listen for God. We read this morning, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. They had some fear, and, and I think they rightly would, just like you and I have some fear about the future and what you're facing, what you may be dealing with in your life this morning. But he said, do not be afraid. I'm bringing you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. 
I don't know if you've experienced this as a teenager, as I did, that there could be a diagnosable common disorder that I had as a teenager called selective hearing. Anybody ever had that? Selecting hearing. It's amazing how that when my mom and dad would say to me, take out the trash, I didn't seem to hear them, but I never missed dinners ready when that was announced. I always made it there. And sometimes I, I've, I've experienced this in marriage with Lisa. I have sometimes never outgrown selective hearing. I hear what she says, but I'm not fully listening. Well, just take in the last month. I asked her what she wants for Christmas. And I've listened. I've heard her. Give me the list of the few things she wants for Christmas. And I'm making a mental note of that. I think I hear what she says. But three days later, I can't remember one thing she said. I don't know what she wants. And so I made up some excuse to go to there the second time and say, what was that list that you gave me the other day? And she was gracious and she gave me the list again. And I thought, now don't forget that. Listen to what she says. And three days later, I couldn't remember one thing. Now I have to come humbly. And I said to her, Lisa, I need to ask you one more time, and this time I'm going to write it down. And if you were doing this to me, I'd really be ticked off that you didn't hear me the first time. So I'm coming and, and, and begging for your mercy I'm going to hear you listen, but this time I'm going to listen and I'm going to write it down what her list is of what she wants for Christmas. And I did. And some of you are saying, that's, that's all the list is? Oh, but you don't know what's on here. Uh, it doesn't take much of a list of the things she wants. But I wrote it down and I've been guarding this among my prized possessions because I don't want to have to go back. And say, Lisa, what was it you said you wanted for Christmas? And somebody's saying, you mean you haven't bought a Christmas present yet? Oh, no, it's way early. We don't do that until Christmas Eve or a couple of days before. That's half the fun. Well, some of you agree, some of you don't. See, I hear her, but I'm not fully listening. Hearing is simply perceiving a sound, and we live in a world of noise. Isn't that true? We live in an incredible world of noise. Think of it, 24-7 news shows, news bites, YouTube clips, conspiracy theories, multiple and contradictory and divisive perspectives, the music playing all the time, the radio playing all the time. We hear lots of things going on. As I did on the interstate this week, the honk of the truck. Anybody know what this means from a trucker? Well, I think it means, Lisa looked it up. I think it means, thank you for letting me in the lane when I turn my turning signal on and not crowding me out in a big semi truck. I'm hoping that's what it means. Maybe some of you listening by live stream know what that is, but he honked at me and gave me the, 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 the symbols out, out the window. I'm hearing, there's lots of noise going on. But the question is, do we listen and understand what we're hearing? Because listening, I would say to you this morning, is different from hearing. You had that question that Melissa asked a little bit ago. Listening is paying attention to the message in order to not only hear it, but to understand it and then respond to what you have heard. These shepherds, faithful shepherds, 
Come all ye faithful. The faithful shepherds did exactly that. They not only heard the angel on the hillside, they listened to the message out of the darkness, out of their fear, out of the uncertainty, out of the potential threats of the message that was being given in a political environment that was not friendly to a new king or a messiah coming into the picture. They did not have selective hearing. They did it. We have a lot of examples of that through Scripture where people not only heard, but they listened and responded. One of the disciples of Jesus, James, wrote in his epistle in James chapter 1 when he said, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Then he goes ahead to say, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Jesus said it this way. He said, my sheep, my followers, my sheep, know my voice. They listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I read just recently in my devotions a verse that spoke volumes to me out of this when Jesus wrote in John chapter 14, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me and the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them. And this is the part that caught me. I, I, I've read this many times, but it caught me again this week. If you listen to my commands, you do my commands, and you express your love to me by doing what I command you, this last part, I too will love them and reveal or show myself to them. You want to see Jesus? You've been wondering where Jesus is hiding out, why Jesus doesn't reveal himself to you, and it doesn't seem to reveal. It Could it be possible that, that there's some place where you are not following through on his commands, and you are not expressing and living out your love in, in relationship to him, and you're listening, you're hearing, but you don't listen to what he's saying to you. And so he says, I can't show myself, I can't reveal myself to you if you're not living in the commandments and in my love. Erwin McManus, in his book, The Barbarian Way, tells a story of um, his son Aaron, who was five or six, when he began asking, what does God's voice sound like? That's a great question for a five or six-year-old. What does God's voice sound like? His dad answered, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. And a few years later, Aaron went off to his first junior high camp. And in the middle of the week, he went up, uh, the pastor, Erwin, went up to the camp with another couple from their church just to see how the kids were doing. As far as he knew, everything was fine. But when he got there, he learned that Aaron had been, invo had been involved in a fight and had assaulted another kid and been held back by his friends. And he was unrepentant and he wanted to leave the camp. And he got all of his stuff out of his cabin and he went and threw it in the car and was insisting that he was leaving the camp and he wasn't going home. He wasn't going to stay. He was going home. His dad came to him and said to him, could we take a walk in the woods the last time before we go? Erwin says, I, I took him into the woods and we sat on two large rocks in the middle of the woods. And his dad said, Aaron, is there any voice inside you telling you what you should do in this situation? Yes, Aaron responded. Well, what's the voice telling you, dad asked, that I should stay and work this out? His dad said, can you identify that voice? And Aaron said, yes, it's God. His dad said, in that moment I waited, it was a moment I'd been praying and waiting for. And he said, Aaron, do you realize what just happened? 
you heard the voice of God speak to you in your inner soul. Forget everything else that's happened. You just heard the voice of God speak to you. And you are able to recognize that it is God speaking to you in your inner soul. I'm wondering this morning, in the situation you're living into right now, what is God speaking into your soul, into your consciousness? into your awareness, you know what he wants you to do with the challenges that you face. Could I encourage you this morning to listen to the voice of God? Not simply to hear it, but to respond to it. How do we begin to do that? Well, the second thing that I take out of this is that we have to learn not only to hear and listen to the voice of God, but we have to learn to reduce what I call the lag time in your obedience. Dr. Don Wellman, a great pastor of a day gone by, wrote a discipleship program that I was introduced to as a young man, and he talked about this concept of lag time in our obedience, and it's simply this, how long from the time that you know what God wants and you understand what God wants in your life. How long does it take you to go from the moment you know and understand to the place of obedience? He called the middle space between hearing and listening and knowing and doing the will of God lag time in obedience. It's interesting when you read this story to the shepherds because nowhere in this particular story do we read that they were told to go to Bethlehem. Did you catch that? When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem, see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us. So they hurried off. They made the decision to go, but they were never told to go. They were told, you will simply find, if you choose to go, they were not told to go. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. That will be a sign to you if you choose to go. But they had to make a decision. They could have waited the rest of the night. That would seem reasonable to me. They weren't told to go now. They could have waited till daybreak. They could have waited till after breakfast. They could have, they could have used it in a, a, another way in which they did it. They obeyed the message of the Holy Spirit immediately. Let me ask you again this morning. How long does it take you to get up, to saddle up, and to go when the Spirit of God speaks to you? What is it that delays us? I don't know about you. There have been times in my life where there was this lag time because of the fear of failure, a fear of the future, fear of people. What are people going to think? A fear of the unknown, a fear that, that, that there would be rejection if I obey this. What's going to happen? Will I be the only one? And am I just going to have to lean into this all by myself? There's another story in the New Testament where God spoke to a godly man, a person who was faced with a decision, but there was some lag time. It's the story in the book of Acts where the Lord called in a vision to Ananias in Acts chapter 9, and, and Ananias knew it was the voice of the Lord, and he said, yes, Lord. And the Lord said to him, I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Now, in verse 17, it tells us that in A, that Ananias went to the house and he entered it. It seems like he would have obeyed. God's Spirit spoke to him. But I love this account because if you read in the 15th 
verse, in the middle between chapter, verse 11 and verse 17, there's this whole dialogue in which Ananias is arguing with the Spirit of God about going up to see Saul, who would later become Paul and write the epistles that we have in the sacred inspired scripture. And he's arguing with him because Saul has been killing Christians and he knows the reputation and he argues with God about whether it's safe to go be with this bad guy that has been known to kill so many Christians. And the Lord doesn't argue very long with him. He just simply says to him, go. And Ananias, to his credit, even though there was lag time in the argument process, he gets up and he goes, and the ministry of Saul, who became Paul, was set in motion, and a ministry that would literally change the Gentile world that made it possible for us to even be here this morning and, and to sing and to worship and to experience the presence of the Lord. Oh, the lag time. Erwin McManus tells the rest of the story of his son Aaron. You remember, he was leaving camp and he heard the voice of God saying, you need to stay and work it out. Well, Aaron was not ready to do what was heard. In fact, Erwin tells the story. He said, I will never forget Aaron's dug-in response when he admitted he had heard the voice of God. He said, well, I'm still not going to do what God wants me to. His dad began to explain to him that that was his choice. But he said, here's what will happen if you choose to not listen to the voice of God. If you reject the voice of God, he told Aaron, that's coming deep from within you and you choose to disobey this guidance, your heart will become hardened and your ears will become dull. And if you keep going down that path, there will be a day when you will not hear the voice of God any longer. He said, there will come a day when you will even deny that God ever speaks to you or that he ever has spoken to you because you haven't responded when he did. But he said, Aaron, if you'll treasure God's voice, however it comes to you, through the scriptures, through your conscience, and respond to God with obedience, then your heart will be softened and your ears will always be able to hear the whisper of God in your soul. Erwin tells the, the story that Aaron chose to stay at the camp. He said, I'm grateful that he did. If he had chosen differently, he would have begun a path toward nominal discipleship. And then he said, many people have become good people who sit in church as faithful attenders. And by everyone else's estimation, he writes, it's a good man, it's a good woman, but they no longer hear the voice of God, and they're no longer a close, intimate Jesus follower. Oh my. Oh my. How many churches are filled today with people who once heard the voice of God, but they stopped responding to the inner voice. And you begin to hear the language. God never speaks to me. I don't know if I've ever heard his voice. And they become nominal, church-going disciples who follow in name, but they never hear. They never listen to the voice of God. In a recent book entitled Faith for the Exiles, David Kinneman and Mark Matlock looked at what did a study of young people who have stayed faithful to Jesus and the church 
in the church and those who have left it and rejected Jesus. They were interested to know if there was a discriminating factor in those who have stayed and those who have left in their faith. So out of a process of studies and some surveys, they, they came up with what they called resilient disciples. The ones who stayed committed to the core principles of the faith, who testified to experiencing greater joy and intimacy. And the discriminating factor for them was that in their young developing years, they came to a place where they experienced a personal intimacy with Jesus beyond just confessing a relationship with him. In fact, the resilient disciples, as they gave it to us, and I put it in your notes, are far more likely to say that this intimacy with Jesus has brought them joy, 90% versus 48%. They would say that, that, that this intimacy is with Jesus is the difference that because they've shaped their whole life and their body and their mind and their heart and their soul, 88% versus 51%. And it impacts, they said, the way that we live our everyday life, 86% to 49%. They said when we read the Bible, it makes us feel closer to God, 87% versus 44%. And listening to God is a big part, listen, listen to that, listening to God is a big part of their prayer life, 78 to 48 percent. And they also mark that prayer does not feel like a chore, but a vibrant part of their life, 64 percent to 39 percent. You see, it's possible to sit in church. In fact, I would dare to say that in the last three years, the exodus from the church, maybe in large part to the fact that people have grown weary of the church and religion because they've never heard the voice of God and developed an intimacy with Jesus. The shepherds teach us that there's no need to hesitate when God calls and Ananias shows us that that though we may hesitate, we need to move quickly to trust God and the amazing things that wait. And when we do, the world changes, our life changes, your life changes, everything changes when we respond to the voice of God. And that leads us to the last thing that I get from the shepherds. They decided they were going to speak up and not be silent. You see, you cannot hear the voice of God and listen to it and begin to do it without also talking about that. Luke 2 says, when they had seen what him, they heard, spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. They didn't stop at hurrying to see the things that had happened. With, even with the doubts that were seen in the video, they had to make a decision that regardless of what the future holds or no matter what doubts we may have about what we have seen and heard, we're going to speak about that and the amazing things begin to happen. The shepherds return, the scripture says, glorify and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as he had been told. Suddenly, they were no longer shepherds. They were evangelists. They were talking about what Jesus was all about. I'm going to ask you this morning, what do you talk about in your faith? How do you talk about your faith? How do you talk about the church? How do you talk about the ministries of the church? Do you talk about what the articles of faith or what your church believes, or do you talk about the changed lives that faith in Christ develops and means in your life? Do you talk about Jesus, or do you just talk about doctrinal statements? Do you talk about what's in the Word, or do you talk about what's in a manual, or in our confessions of faith? Never connecting that our confessions of faith first come out of here. They're not written by men. They come from the Word of God. What do you talk about? 
if, if what we begin to do, we join these faithful shepherds from a long ago starry night, share the good news that the Messiah is alive. It is my prayer in this season that we may learn to not only hear, but listen for the voice of God. And when he speaks, however that may be in the inner soul, through his word from the sky, we will experience little or no lag time. Reduce the lag time to obedience. And speak the good news of our Messiah.